Um, once again, home Ryder Trauma Center, which is home to our University of Miami Jackson Memorial Burn Center. Uh, burn Center for about 30 years. Um, and we're having some remote problems. So Burns What's Hot, this was the title uh, given to me by somebody over here. I, would t I just had it called Burns, but uh, I'm gonna talk not so much about entirely what's all brand new and hot because uh, not that much is really brand new and very hot. So it's gonna be a little bit of a review and then I'll look at some of the things that are uh, more current, the last year's literature things that sort of uh, stuck out to, to know about. But I think Burns is something that most people do infrequently enough that uh, you almost can't be refreshed enough. Um, it does. Okay, so uh, basic review from the start. We talk about first, second, and third degree burns. Usually burn doctors don't use those terms. We talk about partial and full thickness burns, but here's a cross-sectional anatomy of the uh, skin. And a first degree burn is a burn that involves only the epidermis. So it's like a sunburn. There's no specific therapy. If the burn involves any part of the dermis, which as you can see is the thickest part of the skin, then we call it a second degree burn, a, par a partial thickness burn. Um, however, you could see that there's a lot of, there's a lot of distance in that, in that dermis. So you can have a very superficial one that behaves in a benign fashion, and a deeper burn in the dermis can behave in a much more uh, malignant fashion. And they can behave physiologically like a full thickness burn. And of course, if you burn the entire epidermis and dermis, we call that the third degree burn. And we're going to see some pictures of all these different kinds uh, as a refresher for everybody. The pathophysiology. Basically, think of it uh, as, as in branding an animal. You take the hot, not that I do this in Miami, but maybe somebody here has some uh, experience. You take the hot uh, a branding iron, and wherever you touch that animal, animal you get a 3D, three-dimensional zone of necrosis. The, the proteins coagulate. It's essentially cooked. That tissue is irreversibly lost. Around that in three dimensions, there's a zone of stasis. And this is the tissue that's at risk. This is why we take care of the wounds. This is why we uh, give patients fluids. This is why we replace their lost volume, is because that zone of stasis can become either part of the zone of the coagulation and be lost, or it can be perfused and saved to not extend the injury. And then around it in three dimensions is a zone of hyperemia that we see as a, an erythematous ring around essentially all kinds of wounds that don't necessarily mean the wound is infected, uh, but it means that the wound is having a, a, an enhanced you know, influx of uh, blood and an immune response to try to heal the wound. It's a normal response. The pathophysiology, we lose the epidermal barrier in a burn, in a second degree burn or deeper, through which we lose moisture, but that's not the major source of volume loss in burns. You actually have a change in the resting membrane potential of your cells, and in a 15% or larger burn, what you get is an, an uh, influx of water into the cell. So you get both an intracellular edema and you get an interstitial edema as well. The loss of moisture across your burn wound is not the major loss of uh, water. You lose protection from infection, you lose body heat, burn patients can become hypothermic even in warm places, and you get the local elaboration of inflammatory mediators in a small burn, and as the burn approaches 15 or exceeds 15 percent, it's a total body, it's a systemic inflammatory response. The first care of burns is to stop the burning. Cool, small burns. So you burn yourself in the kitchen. Uh, don't think back to what you read in the textbook about not cooling burns because it makes you hypothermic. Take that burnt hand and stick it immediately under running water. And there's a paper this year to give a mathematical model to explain why, but everybody's mother knows why. Cool it off and stop the process. It's not that hard. Um, irrigate away chemicals. And remove electricity, of course, without killing yourself with an electric shock, which has been done. Better to turn the electricity off at a switch or unplug the source of the electricity if you can. As I said, a first degree burn, no specific care is needed. Um, it's one of those no, no glory sort of injuries. The people are uncomfortable. They can feel febrile. Uh, maybe take some Tylenol. Uh, but uh, everyone just thinks you shouldn't have stayed out in the sun so long. Second degree burn, more than 15% body surface area, you can expect a systemic physiologic response. Uh, and these patients uh, um, uh, will manifest an inflammatory response. Smaller than 15% burn, the significance is limited to the local wound and it's a local wound issue. Third degree burn of any size can have significant local mechanical effects and you can just take a look at your own hand right now and that skin on the back of your hand or your thenar web 
or the skin overlying your joints on your fingers. And if you full thickness burn that skin, you've got a serious problem in mobility because with all the toys and tools we have, we can't replace what, what God made uh, on, on that skin to slide so freely over joints and tendons. Uh, we just can't replace that. So they can have significant effects. So that's a sunburn. There's nothing to do about it. Just avoid it. Repeated sunburns give you skin cancer. So now it's an oncology meeting for those of you who need oncology CMEs. Um, this is a... This is a typical sort of appearance of a second degree burn. So this is the kid who pulls the tea off of the, uh, the counter or the waitress spills the tea on the, on the stroller where the baby is. And it's a pink, moist, glistening wound. Um, it's very painful. It's sensitive to currents of air going over it. The epidermis either blisters and sloughs away or some well-meaning healthcare provider um, peels it away, which is what we do and we teach to do, but I question that that dogma also, which we're kind of working on right now. Um, but anyway, this sort of a wound is going to close almost no matter what you do to it um, with minimal cosmetic deformity, if any at all, um, because this is a superficial scald burn. Now these are sort of a, a mixed bag. This patient was exposed to some flames, and you see some whitish areas within the pink, and those are probably deeper burns, deep second, maybe third degree burns. The pinker areas are, are superficial, but I'll tell you the mechanism actually matters in a burn. So in flames, even things that look good today, by tomorrow might look like a full thickness burn. Scalding more often stays, uh, what you see in the beginning is what it stays as you, uh, as you follow the wound along. And then here's a patient who dunked his hand in a bucket of tar, and you see the white is third-degree burn. Uh, we've removed some of the tar, and this, this wound is going to go on to require uh, excision and grafting because that tar can be over 300 degrees in the, in the mother pot. And here's a third-degree burn with that textbook description of a dry, gray, white, brown, or black. It's insensate. It's leathery. Uh, and uh, these wounds uh, uniformly have to be excised uh, and grafted to restore function and to restore uh, a skin because there's really no way for that skin to uh, regenerate except by contraction. And that happens. We had, we had somebody, a uh, well-meaning person, uh, pick up a child in Haiti who had been burned. Uh, this is before the earthquake. Uh, and was burned essentially from the shoulder to the knee. And the only treatment was what mom could provide. It was you know, toothpaste and, and you know, um, homeopathic things. Um, and the wound sloughed. There was a large granulation bed, and the child was contracting from the shoulder to the knee to try to close the wound, creating a contracture across the hip. Um, so these things have to be excised and grafted. Otherwise, they only, the only way they know to close is by contracting, because there's no deeper dermal elements to replenish the surface. And here's a, a deep third degree burn and the concept of decompression of extremities. Uh, these patients uh, swell uh, in the burned area. The, the burnt skin becomes like a, like a tourniquet because it, is, uh, uh, it loses elasticity as, it, as, it, uh, uh, is, um, as the proteins are uh, denatured and it, and it forms a, 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 a leather. And uh, you have to decompress these uh, extremities with escharotomies initially, fasciotomies uh, optionally, and, and whatever is necessary to let the muscle swell. We estimate the total body surface area by the rule of nines. The patient's palm are some burn maps. I have examples. Here's the rule of nines, very simple to remember. The head is nine, each arm is nine, the front of the torso is 18, the back of the torso is 18, each leg is 18, the perineum is one. And you can get a rough estimate, initial estimate, which is really all you need because we plan our resuscitation based on this rough estimate and then we titrate it based on the patient's physiologic response. So you need a rough estimate to start. But you can make more detailed estimates with one of these maps, commercially available, or if you send me an email, I'll email you a copy of ours. Um, but it's a London Browder map, and there's different ones for adults and different ones for children. I thought I had the children here. But children's heads make up a bigger percent of their total body surface area. That's why they're so cute. It's sort of a common theme in ET, babies, small animals. Um, and, and you need a special map to, to map out the body surface area. Um, this is uh, just a, the concept of the burns uh, that might involve uh, uh, smoke inhalation. Here's a patient receiving supplemental oxygen. Now, this patient I know happened to have an electrical flash burn, so it's not really a smoke inhalation, but I'm showing it to you for the concept of who should you intubate in a burn. And my concept of intubating the burn patient is very simple. I don't think anything special or different about the burn patient. I intubate the burn patient who can't control his airway, 
who has swelling of his airway, who doesn't have a mental status to support his airway, sort of the same thing as, a, as, a, as a, a, any other patient. Um, I don't intubate them just because they have burns around the face or just because they have singed nasal hairs or just because I think they might have inhalation injury. I watch them for the physiologic response. Now, if it's a large burn, 40% or more, and I know that I'm going to be giving them large volume fluid resuscitation, which might be all wrong, we may come to discover in the coming years. Um, but if I'm going to give them that resuscitation, I know they're going to swell. I don't intubate them stat right now because they're going to swell later. I bring their family in. I talk to them. I find out about their own wishes, advanced directives, any religious things, anything I can do to let them understand what's about to happen, and then electively, calmly, nicely intubate them to protect the airway. Because you never want to have to intubate a face that looks like this. You're thankful this tube is already in when you see a face like this or like this. You don't want to have to intubate it. The inhalation injury is usually, it's an, uh, the heat is an upper airway injury. You really, the heat exchange of the upper airways is so good that heat just doesn't reach the alveoli. So the upper airways get heat and chemical injury. The lower airways and the alveoli is a chemical alveolitis. And this is a larynx at autopsy with the hemorrhagic mucosa from the, the heat and chemical uh, injury from a smoke inhalation. So the formula we use, and this is just a, a this is one of your MOC questions. Uh, so I, I put it up here, and uh, um, there, there are deviations from this also, but the Parkland or Baxter formula is lactated ringers, 4 cc's per kilo per percent body surface area over 24 hours, half in the first eight hours, which if you do the math, it's a large volume. So if you don't work in a burn center and you get a 60% burn and you do the math and you discover you're having to give them four or five or 600 cc's an hour, your math is right. Start it and consult the burn center um, right away. We do some things to modify these volumes. There's a consensus formula that uses lower uh, volumes. There may be some role for colloids. But in general, this is the, the standard you know, conventional wisdom formula for resuscitating a burn. But we titrate that to urine output. And all we want is normal urine output, not super physiologic urine output. High voltage injury is a problem. Um, any electrical injury is a problem, of course. This is a boy putting a young man putting a, a boat into the water. The, the mast of the boat hit a low-hanging wire, 14,000 volts. And uh, what you end up with is a forearm that's alive and a hand that actually is alive, but the wrist being such a great resistor because it's so full of bone, gets so hot, the soft tissue dies, the vessels can thrombose, um, and they end up losing their, their forearm um, even after successful decompression because stuff in the wrist has essentially cooked. The, uh, the burnt uh, muscles uh, the spill myoglobin, you get myoglobinuria. Again, this is dogma that we alkalinize and give the mannitol. It may be wrong, but that's the dogma for now. Uh, that's what you practice if you don't have um, a, an alternative uh, thought or a plan. And uh, in this case, it blew off this uh, young man's uh, toe as well. You see there's only four there, and he's not from the cast of The Simpsons. So historically, burns were treated um, with uh, suppuration, granulation, and delayed grafting, meaning uh, up until the 1920s and 30s, uh, 40s, 50s, what happened is you just put some topical salve of some sort on the burn, and you allow it to fester. You got a layer of pus under the burn eschar. The burn eschar fell off, and a surgeon didn't become involved until it was time to put skin grafts on the granulation bed. So suppuration, granulation, and delayed grafting were, were the modalities. We don't do that anymore, and I'm going to show you a picture of the sort of modern treatment. But now what we do is we remove any loose epidermis. If we're not going to operate right away, use a topical antimicrobial, silver sulfadiazine, maffinite acetate, or silver nitrate, to any wounds not requiring excision or awaiting the decision to excise, and then you excise and graft the deep wounds. Now, again, another MOC question. The silver sulfadiazine is, has a superficial uh, treatment. It doesn't penetrate eschar. Maffinide acetate penetrates more deeply. Maffinide acetate is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and causes a metabolic acidosis. Silver nitrate is extremely cheap, and so you never hear about it, but it's about five cents a metric ton. It uh, kills bacteria, and it doesn't impede uh, wound healing, so we actually still use it uh, uh, quite a bit. But in any case, the deeper wounds need to go on to excision and grafting. Here's a man who was working uh, in a roofing job, and a bucket of tar spilled onto his back. It was clear that it's third degree, so we took him straight to the operating room. Here he is in the prone position, uh, getting ready to uh, excise and graft. And uh, basically, we take the, the knife. This is called a, a Watson knife. It's a straight-edge razor with a guard on it, and we go back and forth, sort of. If you've never, 
If you've ever gone and had a gyro or a shawarma and you see them slicing off the superficial layers, that's what we do. Till we get to some normal punctate bleeding live tissue, we take that off. In smaller areas, we use a knife. It's called a Goulian knife with a wet blade, similar thing, straight edge razor with a guard. Remove the burn, get some, some punctate bleeding. Once we've done that, we go to an area of normal skin and with an air-driven dermatome, harvest a skin graft, and I'll show you a new article about a new technique for, for doing this, but we take a, a split-thickness skin graft about 12 one-thousandths of an inch deep, and we can run that then through a mesher, expand it over the wound, staple it in place, and a couple of weeks later in clinic, we have um, you know, good motion, a reasonable cosmetic result. There is a scar, but this is, this is sort of the modern burn care that was first really described in the uh, late 60s uh, by um, uh, a woman named Jen Sakovic, who really completely broke with dogma um, and performed early excision, which had not been done before. But she broke with dogma, was laughed off the stage at the American Burn Association, and has become really the mother of modern burn care by, by espousing this early excision and grafting of burn wounds rather than just letting them puss out and grafting the granulation bed later. What to do with blisters is a big unknown. It's, a, it's an item of religious faith more than anything else. Um, our practice is if it's a thick-walled, durable blister, uh, we leave it in place uh, because uh, we think that, and we've seen, that when the blister finally does break a week or so later, the wound underneath is healed and the patient has been spared the pain. There are others who feel it's a terrible inflammatory milieu and it has to be opened, uh, which is accompanied by the wailing and gnashing of teeth as the patient is in severe pain with all the dressing changes. Um, so when I come with this blister, please leave it alone until it, until it falls off. The topical antimicrobials, I mentioned silver sulfadiazine, maffinite acetate, silver nitrate, and bastration or triple antibiotic ointments. Really no good evidence for any one or the other. Actually no good evidence for any of them. It's only in the larger wounds, and not the biggest wounds, sort of the middle size wounds, those 40 to 60 percent type of burns, where you can actually have a benefit from an antimicrobial. The small burns, it doesn't matter what you put on, they're going to heal. Uh, you can't really, you don't, we don't know that you can prevent infection with an antimicrobial. The big burns, it has nothing to do with that infection. It's failure to resuscitate. It's the medium ones where the topicals might help. But the standard of care, conventional wisdom dogma, slap some antimicrobial goo on the burn when you see it in the emergency room. Other options, instead of putting a goo on there, are closed options, and you can put allograft, cadaver skin, if you have it in your hospital, porcine, xenograft, pig skin, if you have it in your hospital. And there are a variety now of commercially available, covered up and don't mess with the wound type dressings that are silver impregnated or collagen impregnated or all sorts of things. They tend to be expensive. Um, anything that will cover up the wound. And there are centers that have done it with saran wrap, non-sterilized, kitchen-grade saran wrap on a, on a second-degree burn, and they tend to do fine. Um, we use a product, I won't use brand names, but we use a silver impregnated sponge with a silicone surface that's non-stick, it's convenient, um, and uh, the patients seem to like it. So that's sort of the standard, that's what you do routinely in burns. So what's new? This is literature from just this past uh, year alone, 2012 alone, from Tina Palmieri in California, long-term functional outcomes in the elderly after burn injury. Basically what it points out is uh, for those over 60, if you go to a sniff, you're twice as likely to die as if you go home. And if you have uh, government insurance, like we heard yesterday, uh, you know, government insurance or uh, lack of insurance, also more likely to die. So the take home is before you send someone to a sniff, try to make sure you've optimized whatever you can because you've doubled the chance of them dying in the months soon after they're discharged from a burn if they're elderly. Uh, how to cool a burn, we mentioned this, everybody's mother knows, put an ice cube on it, put something cold on it, butter is just cold, toothpaste, whatever, water. And these, uh, this group made a mathematical model showing how the heat transfer works and shows that, in fact, if you immediately cool something, uh, you can reduce the volume of the burn. Uh, cooling it for hours doesn't help. The first 30 seconds is all that matters. You cool it and it's finished. Uh, so go ahead and cool those small burns. Don't douse your patients in the trauma room or in the emergency room. They've cooled. They have left the scene. This is only for you and your kitchen, uh, not for you to do in your emergency room. Um, uh, this paper looked at the creation and validation of a tool for assessing the risk for uh, deep venous thrombosis. It used to be dogma that burn patients don't get DVT. Modern burn surgeons uh, accept that burn patients do get DVT. This study identified the rate of DVT somewhere between 1 and 5 percent, and the risk factors were the presence or absence of inhalation uh, and then the size of the burn. And those, those factors lead to a, a, a risk of 1 to 5 percent 
uh, that can be scored and anticipated. Uh, I don't think it means anything different how you're going to manage the patient, but it's probably a good research tool. In terms of taking split thickness skin grafts, this is a novel idea. Uh, sometimes when you have a very big burn, uh, you run out of donor sites. Well, this group went ahead and took the first harvest of a split thickness skin graft, and then right on the same site, they went ahead and took just dermis. And if they took each of those at 10 to 12 one thousandths of an inch, they could get two slices and, uh, and go ahead and cover up a larger area of wounds. That deeper layer of dermis has dermal elements in it that will reform an epidermis when you put it on the new wound. So they were able to effectively double their donor harvest from the same site. So that's a nice technique. I think that's very useful. It should get some publicity, and uh, I plan to try it. Um, here's a study from the Army Institute of Surgical Research. They looked at patients who had CT scans who also had bronchoscopy, and they looked to see if the CT scans could anticipate the severity of, of, of inhalation injury as measured by respiratory failure, death, pneumonia. And they found that using an animal scoring system they had created for CT grading of smoke inhalation, that yes, in fact, uh, you could uh, anticipate the severity of smoke inhalation by a CT. I'm not advocating the use of a CT. Here's one where I'm kind of with Dr. Maddox. A lot of these labs and things are used to say to predict, but you know, in any one patient, either something happens or it doesn't happen. So I don't much need to predict that my patient has an X percent chance of having a smoke inhalation problem. If he gets pneumonia, I'll treat it. Uh, and if he gets respiratory failure, I'll treat it. But knowing that there's a 16 percent chance doesn't help me much. And then this I thought was fascinating. In the Journal of Burn Care and Research in 2012, Spontaneous Human Combustion in the Light of the 21st Century. It's a review of spontaneous human combustion. And in fact, they have determined that it does exist. It wasn't an April Fool's uh, humorous piece. And uh, there are, there are uh, numbers of case reports over the years. And what they've done is try to figure out what's going on. And the theory is that patients who have undergone spontaneous human combustion um, had had to die either shortly before or shortly after the so-called combustion. There has to be a heat source. There has to be a break in the skin. And the fat melts and feeds a slow-burning, very hot fire by acting as a wick. And so there's 10 or 20 cases in all of recorded history. And they've written a nice paper describing spontaneous human combustion. Uh, you can use this for pimping on rounds. I don't know what other use it is, but I thought it's kind of interesting. It exists. And then what's hot and burns, you've probably heard about things like the skin gun. Uh, there's a video on YouTube, I think, from Penn State where they're spraying a, a suspended culture of cells. Um, and I haven't seen that commercially available. Uh, but I think what's exciting is something in our own center. One of my partners, Carl Schulman, along with a member of the Department of Dermatology, have received a grant from the Department of Defense to take allogeneic stem cells from uh, bone marrow um, and have those available um, on the shelf to seed burn wounds with and see if they, can, uh, if they can go ahead and heal burn wounds faster. The dermatologist has done it in some venous stasis ulcers and smaller wounds. Um, and the promises of this is that if you can do it with allogeneic uh, stem cells, you can harvest it, have it on the shelf, and send it to forward hospitals. You could send it uh, you know, with the military. Uh, you can have it on the shelf, not waiting for things. So the promise of stem cells is real. Uh, I think give this another 15 years, and we actually will be uh, treating burns with stem cells to regenerate skin. So things will get much better for sure. And with that, I'd like to conclude, hopefully bringing us back to on time on our program this morning. Thank you, and we'll be having some questions and answers.